No. Oh, no. Oh, no. no. So it was called Virtual Edinburgh. Okay. okay. Um, so, maybe a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But briefly, it's uh -huh. um, really an infrastructure to enable people to be projects. Ah. So it's, it's like a uh -huh. project to enable other projects. No, okay, so almost like the infrastructure behind iSpot or something. Not as sophisticated as Oh, okay. Not, not, okay. Not, not as specific as right? right, 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 So right, basically, right. it's a place where you can put your data, uh -huh. a place where you can analyze data, and, 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 and a means of um, uh, making a, user facing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So the three layers. Right. Oh, so it's a kind of like um, sysside.org? Um. Well, okay. it's not specifically about citizen science. It's about oh. any, any, oh, any just anything any processing any mappable data. Ah, oh, okay. So, so okay. the idea is that um, mm -hmm. um, people will be able to students, but right. not right. anybody will be able to uh, map things, oh. manipulate maps, analyze, right. present them in apps, mm -hmm. create apps, um, and that uh, we'll keep it all together so. That Everything that yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing, right? I mean, you know, we look at so many of these projects and the video has been good for so many guys. Exactly. So that's great. Is to, to make uh -huh. this work cumulative. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. <laughs> I, hope can, I hope we can chat a bit afterwards. Sure, absolutely. Oh, I'd love got a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Maybe at uh, uh, lunch. Maybe at uh, lunch? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, a minute to go. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, welcome to the Citizen Science session. I'm Jonathan Silvertown, and our first speaker is Jennifer Border. Jennifer, just I've lost the cursor. <laughs> No, we're fine for more. Thank you. I hoping this works when we press the button. Um, how much did you find this? It was. It, it was this, wasn't it? You no, it was something else last time. But Should the we just click that? Oh, we don't want to update. Sorry. No. The mouse is gone. Oh, there we go. It's back again. Okay. It probably went to the other screen. Oh, there's another. Oh, there we screen. go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm talking about a recent project I did where we use citizen science data to determine how bats are likely to be affected by urban planning and whether it's possible to mitigate against this impact at all. So firstly, well, why should we be worried about urbanisation? Well, urbanisation is currently one of the fastest growing forms of land use globally and is presenting an increasing effect, um, threat to biodiversity. Um, so how does urbanisation affect bats? Um, well, most bats are negatively affected by urbanisation, as many other species, but the effects vary depending on the species, and they also vary depending on the sex for some bats. So you can have direct effects, for example, the effect of light and noise pollution, which can disrupt ecolocation and affect their hunting. Um, then you have the effect of roads, so they can act as a barrier, preventing bats from getting to good hunting grounds. And cars can directly collide with bats. Um, you also have pet cats, which are a bit of a problem in that they can predate on the bats. And the cramped conditions they often have to inhabit in urban areas means they can get diseases more easily. 
So, for example, white nose syndrome, which is shown in the middle picture here. Um, you also have indirect effects. So, urbanisation often means destroying natural habitats. Um, and then that can affect the bats because they don't have anywhere to go anymore. So, the aim of this project was to quantify the potential effects of proposed housing plans on the activity and occurrence of bats and to investigate how we might be able to mitigate against this. So we used Norfolk as a case study and we got the council's housing plans for the next 10 years and this equated to roughly 66,000 new houses which will be affecting an area of about 27 kilometres. And we used citizen science this to collect our bat data. Um, so basically volunteers would sign up to get a detector and they borrow a bat detector from one of 24 distribution centres spread throughout Norfolk. And they borrow a detector for three nights, then put it in a different space in a one kilometre square each night, but making sure they're at least 250 metres apart for the different sample sites. Um, so from this we managed to get a really good coverage, both of rural areas and urban areas. Um, and the pictures on here are some of the sonograms produced from the bats. Most of that stuff is um, analysed automatically now, so you don't have to do too much work there. Um, so this is a map of the area we managed to cover, that's Norfolk, and you can see we got a pretty good coverage of Norfolk. Um, so roughly 20% was covered, which is about over 1,000 one kilometre squares, and this equated to over 4,000 complete nights of recording, and over 1 million individual recordings. Um, and from this, we found that in Norfolk we have 12 bat species, um, so they're all pictured here. Uh, the main thing to mention here is that two of the species are very difficult to distinguish acoustically, <coughs> which is Brant's bats and whiskered bats here. So we um, had to analyse them as a species pair instead. Um, so if we go on now to look at the analysis, um, we modelled both bat activity, which is the number of recorded calls for each species each night, on the detector, and the presence or absence of a bat at a detector of bat occurrence was also modelled. Um, and we looked at this in relation to habitat variables and human population density. And then we also included season and year to account for a temporal variation. And we had a random effect of kilometre square too to account for the variation in distribution of surveys between squares. Um, so this allowed us to create maps of the predicted distribution for each bat species across Norfolk. We did each species separately because they've got very different habitat preferences and requirements. Um, and then we checked the predictability of each model using cross-validation. Cross um, here I'm only really going to talk about the occurrence models because the activity models show basically the same thing and there's not really time to do both of them. So if we go on to how we actually managed to look at proposed housing impacts, we basically adapted the models that we had to account for the impact of housing. So we reduced the habitat in squares where buildings were by the amount of area the buildings were projected to take up, and we increased the human population density in these squares by the average number of people you would get occupying a house. Um, but we didn't allow building on certain habitats like freshwater and coastal and existing houses because you can't realistically build on those places anyway. Um, so, our initial models of how bat occurrence was affected by human population density and habitat are shown here. Um, so the species are listed along the top and then you've got habitat variables down the side, so arable, coastal, broadleaf woodland, coniferous woodland, fen marsh and swamp, water, improved grassland, natural grassland, <coughs> and human population density. Um, the red colours here show positive effects, and the blue colours are negative effects, and the darker the colours shows that it was a more significant effect. So the really, um, the really pale colours like these are non-significant effects, and the darker ones are increasingly significant effects. So we're not going to go through this in great detail, because this isn't really the point of the analysis, but there's a few things that are worth drawing your attention to. Um, so you can see here quite clearly how important woodland is for bats. So it has a strong positive effect for most of the species, especially broadleaf woodland. And similarly for water, that also is strongly correlated with a lot of species positively. Um, if we then go on to look at human population density, 
you can see for most species they're negatively affected by that. Um, there was a non-significant positive effect for the nocturnal, but all the rest had a negative effect. But only five of these were actually significant. And it's quite interesting here anyway, just to see the differences between the different species in their um, preferences for different habitats. So we found that the impact of the housing depends a lot on what species you're looking at. Um, so the top map here shows the um, predicted occurrence for soprano pipistrol and barbastol. And you can see soprano pipistrol is quite ubiquitous throughout Norfolk. But barbastol is much rarer and tends to be concentrated in areas of broadleaf woodlands. So this bit here is Fetford Forest, which is the largest lowland pine forest in the UK. And that's really important to quite a lot of the species. Um, so if you then look at the effect on occurrence, which are the bottom maps, you can see they both are negatively affected by housing, but the effect for barbastol is quite a bit more severe than, than for the soprano pipistrol, and the effect in the woodland area is really um, noticeable, so the more darker blue here means the more, ne the more severe the effect. And we also found that the effect varied depending on what habitat was destroyed in the building. So if you build on broadleaf woodlands, you're going to have a much stronger effect than if you build on habitat that the bats don't like so much, like fen marsh and swamp. So in summary of these effects, basically the new housing is predicted to reduce the occurrence and activity of all of Norfolk's bat species, though the amount varies depending on the species. And at the one kilometre square level, we found some of these effects were quite severe. So you get up to a 98% reduction in the occurrence of a particular bat species. But then when you look over the county level, these effects get quite diluted. So the, the, the decrease in the occurrence and activity goes down to about 2%. However, we haven't accounted here for the effect of reduced connectivity and increased fragmentation. So the effects might actually be much worse than we've thought about here. Um, so, we looked at how we could mitigate against this impact. Um, we tried two different mitigation scenarios. So in the first one, we skewed the building towards building on the least preferred habitats first for each species. So these habitats would be reduced in preference to the um, preferred habitats. And in the second mitigation strategy, we ignored the council's proposed areas for planning completely and just cited the houses in areas that we thought would be least sensitive. So these were the areas that didn't have many bat species, or they had bat species that weren't very bothered by urban building. This is pretty unrealistic, as you wouldn't actually be able to do this very often, but it gives you an idea of what, you might, what might be possible. Um, so this is our sensitivity map. The darker blue areas are more sensitive areas, and you can see again that the forest is really sensitive. Any building there is going to have a massive impact on the bats. Um, and you could also tailor this towards specific species, so if you have a particular species you want to conserve that's red listed, you could weight that more heavily in the model, and then your sensitivity map will be skewed towards that species. So if we go on to look at the results from this, we've got the bat species here along the top, and the percentage change in occurrence is down the side. Um, so firstly, we look at the effect of the planned housing with no mitigation at all. And you can see it has a negative effect on the majority, well, all of the species really, but the effect for some of them, like common pipistrol, is so small you can't really see it. Um, and then we go on to our first mitigation scenario. Um, so here, this is where we tried building on the least preferred habitats first. And this reduced the negative effect for eight of the 11 species. So it helped the majority, and the negative effect was reduced by about 0.2% on average. But it's not helping all the species. The ones that it doesn't help is the ones that tend to prefer arable habitat, and that's probably because Norfolk is pretty much all arable. So even if you decrease the other habitats first, you still end up decreasing arable habitat. And then in our second scenario, where we tried building on the least sensitive areas for bats and reducing the least sensitive habitat first, Again, this benefited um, most species, so 8 out of 11 benefited from this, and the negative effect was reduced by about half a percent. But again, it's not helping all the species. So you've got so the one that stands out here is Noctual, which is not helped at all by this. 
And the problem here is that the different species have very different requirements. So if you get a sensitivity map based on all the species, you're not going to be able to help all of them. It's going to be overshadowed by the majority, but there'll be a few that'll slip through the net. Which means you need to prioritise your mitigation really towards which species you want to help. Um, so in conclusion, um, housing has a negative effect on bat populations and this effect is more severe if the building occurs in favoured habitats. We can mitigate against this to an extent, but we do have to be aware that the different species have different requirements and so it's quite hard to satisfy everything. Um, and yeah, we may say is thanks very much for listening and thanks very much to all our volunteers for all their time and effort in collecting the data. <coughs> Thank you, Jenny. So, uh, there's time for a few questions. Um, yeah, uh, thanks very much. Um, for your participants, uh, what kind of uh, feedback or um, you know, what sort of things did you do to uh, increase or encourage their engagement in? Um, there's an automated process now that we have working on our cluster where they get sent a report as soon as possible, basically, after they get the test back. And it tells them what bats were recorded in their area and gives them an idea of where that fits in the scale of Norfolk. Okay. And there's also a website with updates, but I think the reports where they get sent out a PDF personal to them is the best thing we've got so far. So you clearly use citizen science to collect the data to do your analysis. So my question is, how are you trying to showcase this to the public in terms of you ask them to gather the data for you? I also your results are showing something that is not very good for them either because you're telling them basically we don't want to do houses. Um, but so you don't actually need them for the population. The interesting thing we found was when you look at population growth in Norfolk, there's far more houses than there needs to be. The population is not predicted to rise anywhere near as much as you could actually house with that. So I guess you've got people like landlords buying up places to rent and maybe a lot of single tenant things. But it, yeah, I don't think they need anywhere near as many as they've got. Yes, it's room for time. Uh, many of the facts you mentioned in your study, boosting houses, I wonder if you should put that into your study, because there's obviously some positive effects of facts boosting in houses, and so you can play availability of boosting space. Um, do you mean putting the facts that like have a variable that's whether they boost the house? Possibly, or? yes. If you're building houses that potentially are suitable for facts, then yeah. essentially you're increasing their range if you've got more boosting opportunities. So should that be added to your model? I think it should be accounted for in the population density system because that's based on, that's correlated to the number of houses. Okay. Hi, um, how confident are you that the technology picks up all the bat, different bat species equally? Because some of them are a lot quieter than others. So yeah. are you confident you've properly picked up all of them equally? Uh, no, probably not all equally. I think for the presence, we would have, if they're there in the night, you probably would have got them if they're around. I think the activity, though, is something that people are still working on getting accurate with bats, so it's supposed to represent abundance, but you're right, it is very different for different species, so you can't, that's why you can't compare species directly if you're looking at activity, because it's not a fair comparison. Okay, thank you very much, Jenny. Um, and our next speaker is Ian Thornhill, who's going to talk about prioritising local action for water quality. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I should have accounted for it being this size of screen, so I do apologise. Um, I hope you've got your glasses on for some of you. Um, okay, I want to talk about um, a study that we did with data generated um, entirely through citizen science. Um, and I mostly want to talk about this in the sense of how we can use citizen science data, not explicitly about an ecological study, although that's what it is. Okay, so um, firstly, Earthwatch, which is uh, work. Um, we've been involved in um, citizen science in the broadest sense of the term since 1971. Um, conventionally that would have been taking students out on expeditions and meeting, um, bringing them to the scientists to take data, like, like many gap year expeditions for example. Um, more recently, particularly in Europe, we've moved our focus to citizen science and we have quite a unique model of engaging with uh, corporates. So we're kind of a a critical friend to corporates and we engage with their staff and their processes in order to uh, engender a more uh, sustainable mindset, at least that is the, the dream and the hope. Um, so really our mission there is to engage worldwide 
in scientific field research and education that promotes the understanding and action necessary for a sustainable environment. The project specifically I work on is Freshwater Watch and uh, all these orange dots minus one or two which are, are not on there at the moment uh, are where Freshwater Watch is, uh, has been in operation for the last um, four years. Um, Freshwater Watch as the name <coughs> implies is very much a water quality um, data gathering exercise um, and investigations of um, aspects of urbanisation. Um, so we were in about 37 cities, I think, um, and it's a global study investigating the health of freshwater ecosystems. Wherever they, there is a project on there, and we've got nearly 17,000 data so far, um, they've got a core methodology that is common, um, and then there's some tailored parameters that are uh, locally explicit. So. For example, um, our colleague in Brazil was looking at um, cyanobacteria, har harmful algal blooms, alongside the water quality data that is standard in Freshwater Watch. We have some people in um, Montreal looking at um, stormwater overflows and potential raw sewage entering into the, into the, um, the, the natural ecosystems there, and so on and so forth. But wherever they are, they're collecting the same data. So this is the the core data. Um, we have some qualitative information. Um, this is all done bank side as well, just to add. So it's all done within about 15 minutes. Uh, I think the, the record is about eight minutes, but that's a lot of fumbling and, um, and you can relax. So there's uh, some qualitative components which are about the complexity of bank side vegetation, wildlife that's present, um, and any point source pollution discharge, discharges or potential point source pollutions. So for example, if you've got um, a pipe coming into your, your section, you try and understand where that pipe's coming from and attribute it to, say, residential discharge or road discharge, something like that. Then there's um, sort of qualitative um, and semi-quantitative measures of water conditions. So we have a, a three-point scale of water level, just high, average, low. There's various water colors that we ask them to identify, green, yellow, brown, colorless or other. Sometimes we get uh, purple, that's a mistake. But sometimes we get black, that's genuine, um, depending where you are in the world. And then a measure of turbidity, which is in this Secchi disc here, um, which is a nice, cheap, intuitive way of um, measuring for suspended load in a water sample. Uh, so you fill this up, and when you can't see this black and white disc down the bottom, then um, that's when you take a measure off the side. We then have semi-quantitative measures of nutrients, which are, is a, a global uh, ubiquitous problem um, in these seven categories uh, in a nice contained um, colorimetric um, tube or uh, tube containing colorimetric uh, reagent. That's the core methodology. All of that goes into a smartphone app or a web form um, or a hard copy form, depending on what access they've got. Um, and I should have said that in each of these locations we're partnered with a research institution that is responsible for um, quality assurance, quality control checks and training also. So we have this data set and I took the China data to test whether using the, this, these measures, combining with what other data is, for, is available for free from satellite imagery, could we generate a useful model uh, using these measures to predict poor or vice versa, good water quality. And these are just an example of the, of uh, I think Shanghai, um, Hong Kong, and I don't know, somewhere in China. <laughs> but this is just another novel way of collecting water <coughs> used in the, uh, in the studies. Okay, this is the bit where I needed a bigger screen. Um, but I've pretty much gone through the measures that are here. What we can do with those measures, if you get a sufficient replication, is to get a, a relative measure of um, of, for example, the frequency of algal blooms through if they identify green water or literally an algal bloom. Um, and if they look at you know, the, the percentage of observations where they observe submerged vegetation, floating vegetation, emergent vegetation, could act as a proxy for um, the relative abundance of those things. You know, if it's really obvious and there's some big patches there, they'll mark it down every single time. But if, it's, if there's only small pieces, perhaps it'll only be once or twice. So with the visit, visits over time, we can start to refine what originally are binary measures to be something slightly more continuous. So we have this data. 
um, across the Shanghai, Hong Kong and Guangzhou um, between March 2013 and March 2016. Um, 51 sites were monitored sufficiently, that is to that they gathered seasonal data on a, approximately a bi-monthly basis which accounted, uh, amounted to 1192 samples. We coupled all that citizen science generated data with satellite derived data and forecasting. So um, through R um, and the NCEP or NOAA uh, reanalysis to satellite, I think, um, some combination like that, um, you can take a latitude and longitude and very quickly, for any number of points, uh, uh, generate uh, measures of. Uh, precipitation rates, air temperature, and a suite of other things in, um, in a very quick amount of time. There's also some more familiar satellite imagery, Landsat, um, and also some population density and nit uh, nitrate and phosphate, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus application rates, for example. These are some of the data we put into our analysis. So this is just a screenshot of the Freshwater Watch platform of where we've got data and if this was live I could click on that and we could zoom in and go right down to each individual data point which are instantly uploaded. Sorry I keep walking in front of you. Um, and this is um, slightly more uh, paper orientated uh, output of that where we've modelled the individual site watershed uh, so we could generate land use information between those in uh, ArcGIS. But we also took the a WWF Hydro Basin data set, to, which is a globally available framework for um, hydrological basins at different levels. So the level four, for example, is the dotted line, which pretty much looks at a city-wide, city uh, bigger actually, uh, watershed, whereas you get down to L12, it's much smaller. We used an L4 to take all the data we generated within it to generate a median. In fact, I should go to the next point. Uh, to generate a median from our data for nitrate, phosphate and turbidity uh, to classify each site as either being above that threshold or below that threshold. This allowed us to start looking at relative water quality, whether it was good or bad, and build a model around that. Um, so we used a random forest classification model to establish relative importance of predictors. Um, and we got a reasonable model using this data got a decent accuracy of classifying that sites into that binary classification and a relatively okay reproducibility, replicability, uh, which is assessed through the CAPTA stat there. So reasonably happy with that, we can predict a simple binary classification on a, that is data driven, so not in terms of compliance, which means that we could apply it wherever we're collecting data rather than if there's an absence of data. So it's um, quite a useful approach in that sense. Okay, This is what you can get out of a random forest model. You get a ranking of importance for your predictors <coughs> and then you can plot the marginal effects of the various predictors within your model. So starting here, and this is stability, we can look at what, what variables that went into there uh, were most important for improving the accuracy of the model. Um, or decrease in the accuracy of the model if they're removed. So the color, metric, color metrics, just simply visual identification of color, particularly brown and yellow, is very good for turbidity, I suppose it makes sense. Um, then we've also got bankside trees as being important, and then some of these black ones are watershed characteristics, so the amount of artificial surfaces um, and slope in the catchment. Um, so to explain one of these, for example, watercolour, all of these are basically going up except for observations of green in this instance. instance. Um, as you get increasing observations, the likelihood of being classed into a good water quality category is, uh, is improved for most of these. Uh, bankside trees, for example, is in the opposite direction, which is this solid line here. More observations of bankside trees more likely it is to be in a good category, so lower turbidity values. And we can do that for whatever values, uh, sorry, whatever predictors come out as important. So rainfall again, uh, increasing rainfall in 24 hour period prior to uh, increases the probability that that site will be of, of, uh, of a poor water quality. Artificial surfaces is 
is a little less clear, but it's quite a nice start in that you only need a little bit for it to go straight up with a high, higher probability of being poor water quality, but then there's a slightly less clear relationship beyond that. Um, so that's stability. We get a fairly consistent thing with nitrate, with the colour again. Observations of colour generally means you're likely to be in a, a worse site. But also these ones are quite interesting. So in terms of local environment, um, the presence or the regularity of viewing emergent vegetation or algal observations, again, is another good indication, a visual indication, easy to get indication of a poor water quality site. And the same relationship to, a, to an extent with artificial surfaces and slope is confusing. Um, and I don't, haven't quite figured out why slope is so strange, but it's something to do with essentially where you've got steep watersheds, you have less artificial surfaces and more forest, whereas if it's flat, you've probably got more, more agricultural, more <laughs> urban um, landscapes, but they change regionally, so it's a, it's a difficult thing to pin down. So for nitrate, <coughs> agriculture became important, vegetation, emergent vegetation, and finally, phosphate, again, observations of water colour, vegetation, emergent, uh, emergent vegetation, algal observations, and also population density, which kind of makes sense. That's a very quick overview of all that. Um, so, yes, it was possible to establish a classification model using random forests, which performed acceptably well to identify a likelihood of a site having high or low water quality. Perfect. Um, Consistent indicators, which is potentially quite useful for a citizen science project, were just observations of water colour, frequency of algal observations, and <coughs> the uh, extens extensive extens extensivity, I don't know, the amount of emergent vegetation. Um, and as a data-driven approach, we could potentially take this to um, areas where there is very little information about water quality and start to identify drivers, controls, or uh, indicators of water quality. And one very last slide that I want to talk about, because this is a citizen science um, session, is we've done another analysis looking at survival rates in, across all of our projects, which is in, in uh, review at the moment. Um, and we get this very, in, very clear drop off, uh, which I think is familiar across many citizen science projects. As we go through time, we get differing levels of uh, dropout of, of, um, of citizen scientists, and it's the between 10 and 20 percent that maintain for a long time. I'm afraid you've got to stop. Thank you very um, much that indeed. Was my last uh, word. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's no time for questions. Uh, we're going to move straight on to um, Victoria. <laughs> How's this Hey, morning everyone. So I'm Victoria Burton. Now I'm going to be talking about uh, Earthworm Watch, which is, forms part of my PhD at Imperial College London and the Natural History Museum. It was developed as part of a core from the Earthwatch Institute uh, with my um, two of my supervisors and a colleague at Earthwatch. So big thanks to my uh, co-PIs and collaborators on that. So why did I choose to use citizen science in my research? Well, partly it was personal reasons. Um, as a child, I really enjoyed taking part in citizen science projects and also at undergraduate level, which was the Open University. But I sometimes felt that we were just sort of asking people to collect the data, send it in, and then sort of I heard nothing more. And I was really inspired by this paper of Black Autumn Bees, which some people say was a bit of a publicity stunt, but um, he actually used the, used the school children he did the work with to co-write the paper with him. And this really made me think, you know, why could we use our citizens to actually um, be acknowledged in our papers and even maybe co-author them. So it was partly that, but it was also because um, another thread of my PhD is collating data from other researchers, and I have a lot of data on agricultural and forestry environments, but not so much on urban areas, which actually forms 8% of the UK. And so um, citizen science provides a nice complement to that data set, and it also gives me the opportunity for larger data sets and greater geographic coverage than I could on my own driving around. And also people's gardens, which is difficult to access on my own. So soil animals are difficult um, in citizen science. As an example of this, I've got a map of the UK uh, ladybird survey, which shows its uh, um, records of ladybirds that have been sent in by the public and also by researchers doing uh, biological recording. And you can see it's a nice coverage across the UK, although they're not all very <coughs> obvious 
bright red things that sit on leaves. So certainly enough of them are to get a lovely uh, um, submission data there. And you contrast that to the Earthworm Society of Britain data, which is much more patchy and generally recorded by people who are trained in identification of earthworms. Uh, but earthworms are probably the, one of the better soil animals because they are relatively big, um, even though you do have to dig them up, which is a bit of a barrier. So across the world, we've had various citizen science projects investigating earthworms. One down in Australia way back in the 90s, which used school children to collect samples. A couple in Canada and America, which focus on their importance as invasive species. And here in the UK, the Opal uh, Soil and Earthworm Survey, which actually showed, although it's quite difficult to identify them to species, they can be reasonably sorted into three different ecotypes. And these ecotypes do tell us a little bit about ecosystem function. So the surface feeding um, epigeic small earthworms um, don't make burrows, but they process litter and important in decomposition. The soil feeding endogeics mix soils and are known to increase water infiltration and are associated with higher productivity of soils. And the anesics makes deep burrows, which are again are associated with higher infiltration rates and reduced flooding risk, and also bring uh, leaf matter into the soil and thought maybe to increase the carbon storage of the soil. So the survey aims were based around mapping the ecotypes, um, abundance and diversity across the UK, and seeing how they respond to different land uses, habitats, and environmental factors. And then to actually connect these to the earthworm ecosystem services and produce maps of that. And then again, predict how they might change with predicted land use changes in the UK. And of course, engage uh, the public in what's under their feet, soils and things. So um, one of the limitations of citizen science data is that people differ in their ability to uh, collect and identify the earthworms. And so we designed um, the Earthworm Watch survey to try and account for this by asking people to sample two pairs, sorry, two sites in different habitats. Um, and then we can contrast that and use their um, participant ID as a random effect in mixed effects models to try and account for differences with effort and ability. So this, it uses a standard earthworm method. You dig a hole um, 20 by 20 by 10, sort through, count um, the earthworms, and then we provide a sachet of mustard powder to make up in water to try and get some of these deep burrowing and anesic species out. And then they count and identify the worms and then put them back when they're finished. And we also ask them to record some environmental properties. They're out of plant cover in their square, uh, soil texture on a simple hand texturing just between clay, loam and sand. Soil moisture again on a simple three point scale. We provide a packet of vinegar for as a crude test for calcium carbonate content and we ask them to choose soil colour over a modified uh, Mansell chart. The um, darkness of the colour is hopefully a proxy for the amount of carbon in the soil. So the project went live back in April. It's our screenshot from our website here. And we had a reasonable bout of um, some press, we had some article in the RHS Garden magazine, a little column in the Telegraph and a bit of local radio as well. Um, it's, it was only, we only had funding for about 300 packs to start with, um, so it was sort of an early pilot to see how it was going. And we also had some events planned around the project, uh, which I attended with thanks to um, some grants from the British Ecological Society. This one was at the Bristol Festival of Nature. And uh, more recently at the London Wetland Centre, our relaunch event in September. So these were um, to try and um, recruit people to the project, but also to generally um, introduce them to earthworms. We had some live earthworms on display for them and to show them a little bit more about earthworm ecology. So results so far, uh, we've had uh, 617 participants. Uh, these are some of our tweets from <coughs> our participants and uh, 116 pairs of usable data. Some of the data pairs were incomplete. Um, so, rather a uh, biased uh, distribution towards the southeast, which you might expect, both of our institutions are based in Oxford and London. Um, I'm hoping to try and improve that over the rest of the project. I've got a Welsh language article coming out in the spring, and we're trying to do some events in areas which we haven't picked up many um, participants from yet. And a big thanks to our volunteers, so I couldn't do without them. I was pleased so many actually took part when I first started off. I thought, oh goodness me, what if no one does it? <laughs> so um, I used to uh, put in the environmental variables of six fixed effects, and then the study ID, so the participant ID, and then which pit as a random effects. Then I used dredge on them to try and find the best models. 
um, actually with um, all the interactions included, but none of them came out significant. Uh, this is the model just for the number of earthworms. And so the only ones that came out was significant were moisture and the habitat. And we now used to predict the number of earthworms. Um, the only one that was um, significant was moisture. That's not to be quite expected because we know that earthworms are sensitive to moisture. The habitat's a little more interesting. Uh, we found the most um, earthworms in vegetable beds. I actually thought it might be in lawns because they're relatively less disturbed. But presumably people are adding organic materials or artificial fertilizer to their vegetable beds, which is increasing the nutrients and again increasing the number of earthworms. I then I did some modeling on the actual ecotypes to see if they respond in similar or different ways. So the same environmental um, variables as before, but with the ecotype, and again with the same random effects. And at this time, there was an interaction between the habitat and the ecotypes, and again, only moisture was the only one significant. I hope you can see it, because it's a rather smaller screen than I expected. So with endogenic earthworms, we found um, significantly more in lawns, which was a very highly significant effect, not so much in meadows, and again, the vegetable beds were the most. And then the epigeic earthworms of these surface feeding litter feeders we found more of in shrubs and hedges and woodland, which fits in really nicely with what we know about their ecology. They eat leaf litter, so we find them more in leaf litter environments. So does the paired approach make a difference to this? So while I tried running the total earthworms model as a linear model without the random effects, which I know is not the best way to compare them, and if anyone has any better thoughts on that, I'd be happy to discuss but we did find we had a higher, uh, lower AAC with the mixed effects model. And more importantly, when we looked at the random effects, they actually accounted for 45% of the variation in the total earthworm model and 20% in the ecotype model. So it does seem that we're try we are removing some of that variability caused by people's different uh, levels of doing the survey. So the next steps, our survey began again in October. Uh, running with slightly, we're asking a few more questions about the fertilizer they use to try and find out if there's any differences between organic or inorganic fertilizers. We also offering experimental options where people choose a part of their garden to put vegetable peelings down, and then measure them both after a few months. So actually trying to do an experiment, so it's sort of showing them how scientists create a hypothesis and test it, <coughs> as well as trying to actually have some experimental results about increasing organic matter and soil makes a difference. And eventually I'm hoping to combine with some models of earthworms and soil infiltration to try and uh, predict ecosystem services and how that will change with different land uses, um, change in the future. So, oh, a bit short. Um, so in conclusion, we found the most number of um, earthworms in vegetable beds, especially soil feeding endogenic earthworms. And the most epigenic earthworms are in shrubs and woodlands. We know that's sensitive to moisture and that the paired approach can help minimise variation between participants. Not particularly startling results at the moment, but I was quite reassured that they are in keeping with what we know about earthworms, and it's sort of encouraging that we can use this um, technique to maybe answer further questions on earthworm diversity in the future. So if anyone's interested in taking part, or knows anyone might be, please have a look at our website, or I've got some business cards at the front, and if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Victoria. You should definitely get a prize for your graphics. Oh, well, outstanding. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, some questions. Does this follow on from the Opal project? I mean, did some of the methodologies. Yeah, it was partly inspired by the Opal project. My supervisor, Paul Eggleton, was one of the scientists on that, and he. Uh, but um, so we borrow a lot of the methodology, which was really borrowed from the standard earthworm methods, which were already in place for the Opal project. But we're trying to ask sort of just using the ecotype approach rather than the species and uh, trying to actually um, ask questions on the habitat using this paired approach rather than looking at distribution across the country of the different species. Okay. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, so uh, looking at your project and kind of in response to the previous one for Freshwater Watch in terms of user engagement, have you tried feeding back some of the results you've just shown us to your participants 
And do you think that will help get them more motivated? Yeah, what? I mean, that's something I was really keen to do because mm. often I found when I was a participant, I wouldn't hear what happened. Yeah. We have been trying to write some blogs and results on our website. I mean, it's still quite early days. Um, at the moment, we've got quite a static um, website and people can click and see what they've submitted. And we're hoping to have some more interactive graphics to show how the number of earthworms compares with other people in the country or how if they change the way of managing their garden that might increase or decrease the number of worms, something like that. We have been recording uh, people's reasons for taking part as well and we're hoping to follow up with them during the time of the project to try and get some feedback on how they're finding it and if that inspires them to go further or if it was just something they wanted to do for an hour on a, on a day out. Yeah. There was a question back there. Yes. Yeah, mostly the control has been looking at the pairs rather than that, and we have been mostly <coughs> focusing in a, on air, urban areas because that's nice and complementary to the data I have already. Most of the woodlands within that data set were within air, urban areas, but probably be worth looking at maybe some maps and do some natural mapping and seeing maybe if that actually makes any difference between if they're doing it in the countryside with urban areas, because there might be some differences there. It's time for one more. Yeah. Question at least. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering how you're going to go about targeting those areas of the country where you've got big gaps in your, your yeah, map at the moment, yeah. like around here, for example. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. North of Birmingham, the north, the north is very bad. I was quite disappointed in that. Yeah, well, we are looking to try and get some, get your heads together and get some main lists of different wildlife trusts or other local natural history societies yeah, and areas awesome. that we can target. And also we have some events planned in Durham next year, um, which hopefully to try and get around that area, and also f hopefully filling in the gap, in the weird gap down in the Kent and South East, right at the corner, when we've got an event in Brighton, which I'm hoping we might try and fill well, in the gap as well. I, li I live there, so I... Oh, I'll right, I'll no, that'd be great, yeah. On, yeah. OK, thank you very much, Victoria. Thanks. Our next speaker is uh, Joseph Araya, uh, citizen science reporting in conventional media. Okay, uh, okay good. it feels good to be in a citizen science session. And uh, I'm going to be slightly talking something a little different because we had had very good talks on the research side of it, but I'm going to talk about the conventional reporting of it. Uh, so. As the title says, it's more of a preliminary result, but hopefully it will lead into some sort of collaboration. So, um, is that the press? Oh, no. You have to point it at the uh, uh, USB stick in the computer. Ah, uh, uh, here. Well, unless it's not working. Oh. Just use the space bar. It works well. So I'm going to start with a has anyone watched this film? Okay, uh, it has a perfect combination of a little primary school, children, a newspaper ad, a romantic story, and uh, a, a movie in the end, in IMAX actually. Uh, it is a story of uh, the search for the monarch uh, butterflies um, nesting from when he travels from Canada towards Mexico. And uh, I brought it here because it started with a small newspaper advert in, in the early 1970s by a well-known Canadian uh, entomologist, uh, uh, Fred and his wife. So what the story really starts is a traveling salesman in Mexico recalled that he had seen this advert and noticed that the monarch butterflies hitting his car basically and then what it shows is from this story they were able to piece the scientific basis for the migration of the monarch butterflies so at the moment the monarch uh, watch is the biggest butterfly monitoring citizen science project uh, in the world 
and it's still based in Canada. So what I want to show was that that newspaper clip actually helped solve one of the scientific puzzles we had. And with rising environmental issues, and you may remember recently uh, the ash dieback disease uh, where citizens were being called to report sightings. And even the United Nations Environment Program has a citizen science platform. And I just found out while searching for this. So with increasing global environmental issues, there is also a call for citizens to participate in. I mean, this is not a <coughs> surprise. We have always known that we scientists work out the mechanism of how things happen. And then the policy makers, the powers that we decide on how it's going to be implemented, governance. But this, this has always been a bridge too far. And it has been uh, often recommended that the citizens and the public should participate. And that's where citizen science comes in. Uh, in a sense, unless society participates, unless citizens are aware and they participate, it wouldn't be implemented properly. And that is where our implementation and the way citizen science has evolved in the last few years comes in. We have done the research, we are doing the research, but maybe it is time also to, to involve the citizens into that policy level as well. Uh, this slide is slightly basic for a citizen science special uh, interest group, but I just want to mention that citizen science made it into the Oxford English Dictionary just about three years ago, in 2014. So it's an accepted term now, even the term citizen scientist. Uh, but it involves not only do citizens participate, but also they work alongside or directed by professional scientists. So that is the key part what makes it different from engagement. It's not only telling people we do this and exercise this, but also trying to work at it. I mean, there have been a various models where citizens contribute, but they also they set the research agenda uh, and often a lot of examples like that exist in other fields as well. Now, uh, Victoria, the earlier speaker gave a very good point of why we should be doing citizen science. Simply covering the temporal and spatial scales is just not possible by individuals and scientists. And that is why we need to engage the, the, the general public. But also it is fun and it, it really helps uh, introduce responsibility and ownership. And the example of the students who gave that paper on biology letters shows that it really involves building on the social capital, which at times is often forgotten. And these are some volunteers working in one of floodplain meadows we have with 20 years worth of data still being collected and to be explored further. But how is it being communicated? I mean, I've tried to link it with the general history side of it. Often explorers collected samples, brought them back in the past, and often they shared them with a huge monograph. For example, um, von Humboldt's Big Cosmos, a five-year uh, expedition report. And also sometimes they were shared by organizations which were interested or using, like Freshwater uh, uh, from Earth, which was showing us how they were they are inc incorporating citizen science in their projects. But happy to say nowadays, we have actually citizen science organizations which are looking at various topics. So in, in a brief summary, in the past, for example, in the old bond society, it was bird hunters who shared information through local chapters and newsletters. In the 70s, Blue Peter, the TV program for children, was very popular in, po in initiating this on the TV as well. And still, in the 80s and 90s, there were mostly through field guides by collected by citizen science which helped uh, share the result. But in the recent past, it has become, the web has been a big uh, interface where a lot of information is uh, shared that way, but also social media, especially in the last five, 10 years. And 
we have also now professional organizations like the three citizen science uh, associations, the biggest ones in the world, and also our own special uh, interest group, which I believe the logo probably has changed. <laughs> but in a sense, even books are coming. And these are the recent books. I only picked a few. There is citizen science for families and for children. There is citizen science uh, as a project, as a motivation, as an experience. Um, I just wanted to mention there are also blogs and citizen science repositories where there are thousands of information. I just want <coughs> to mention two. Uh, one highlighted our very own journal, Citizen Science uh, Theory and Practice, which came into being about two years ago. And also iSpot, uh, best referred to as the Facebook of nature, which helps share information among citizen enthusiasts with collection of over 800,000 species, uh, pictures, sorry, 800,000 photographs, and of course, the all-encompassing uh, Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, which has a lot of data. And there are also individual blogs as well. So it is being shared with various media. I think it's the most exciting time to be in citizen science. How about in the scientific literature? And this is just a summary I from a study made by others, but I replicated it myself recently and came up with a very similar number. There has been a massive increase, especially since uh, the 20, 20, 2009, 2010, and it has been growing in the scientific literature. How about in the public media? Uh, the best I could come up was uh, Google Trends, just follows a very similar uh, pattern, rapid increase since uh, 2009 or 10. So it is being hit. Unfortunately, with Google, you can only get percentage increase, so you are never really sure what the numbers mean. So that is the gap that is missing at the moment. Why? As we all know, there is increased uh, availability of tools. There is increased interest. Uh, and there is also increasing demand from funders as well. So there is a lot more interest on citizen <coughs> science. Uh, as a project and is coming in the public media. Now I'm just going to justify why. Why do we need to be interested with citizen science in the conventional media? I have elaborated about five reasons. The first one is uh, we need to understand the reach. If it is how, well, how far is it? Even advertising agencies want to know how far their information is being picked up. And then we need also to ensure timeliness. So for example, the climate prediction exercise involved a few hundred thousands of people, but it needed two years before any scientific publication was to come. So that shows at least the web is, the mass media probably is earlier and faster. And also we need to focus our effort. What is being topical? What should we be looking at? And also uh, the last one is about transparency. I mean, the Fukushima disaster was a very classic case. The citizens were able to put the government on the spot for not giving the right data because they could go out and measure it themselves. So there are a lot of uh, interesting reasons for that. But the one that worries me is only 12% of biodiversity data makes it to, to peer-reviewed publication. Imagine what happens to the other 88% of the data. It may not be good, but I'm sure it says something. So what I came up was, well, I tried to collect data using uh, these tools. I will probably be happy to explain in future if needed. But the key thing is, citizen science keyword searched all over the web in the last three years, used an app to sort it out and post it in a blogger site, which I can access. And then the laborious job of manual tidying up on what sort of projects they are, what is the objective, what is the reach. And I must admit at this point there is a limitation. Unfortunately, I could only search in English and for citizen science, uh, and it reflects in the results. <coughs> and also categorizing was difficult sometimes. The education aspects were sometimes the research related as well. So there has been a few uh, bits of challenge in it, but in any sense, we came up with quite a few results 
per year there are about 700 articles I'm coming through sorting them I found out it's only 10% which are projects most of them are re-reporting and the majority as I say the English speaking part they are in North America compared to the rest of the world and they tend to like birds and fish uh, not, uh, and most were for monitoring and now just these are the brief highlights and I still have to go deeper into tracking them what a story when was it first reported how many times it repeated so we just have to follow it up but it tallies up with what is found in the scientific literature 80% of citizen science projects tend to be on environmental sciences about 20% are on biodiversity out of that 80 and a few very popular ones happen to be space science people looking at galaxies so that's just the general thing but I would like to conclude in the end citizen science is here to stay and it's getting in the public media we probably need to be engaging with that and hopefully we can repurpose the data for something useful as well in the future as we appreciate the limitations we should probably be looking forward to collaboration among as well and I'm happy to if you have any clever ideas because sorting all this data uh, was very hard for my students <laughs> and, and myself 10% were projects 90% was fluff and I would like to finish with this nice highlight a few years old but already the number of participants has increased the species list has increased so it's worth keeping up and it's good to see nice stories like this making it into the mainstream media thank you thank you Joseph there's one minute left for questions burning question so I suppose you sort of answered it but um, have you got any ideas how to um, track the growth in this thing that we call citizen science rather than tracking the use of the term citizen science because that was only popularised well people like Jonathan and Rick Bond for it six or seven years ago there have been a few publications looking at more alternative forms as well so ideally I would have liked to, to look at all those and how they stack up but for the sake of this but uh, I'm hoping to get some ideas from how to sort, especially sorting the huge amount of hits was quite tedious and a very clever way of data. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, our next speaker is Joseph Huddard, and he's going to talk about citizen science and detecting pollution to evaluating ecological restoration. Yeah. Hi there. Good. Good afternoon. So I'll see if I can get this to work. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, I'm just talking um, about an opinion piece that I led on earlier this year. Um, I'm a uh, PhD student at Imperial College in the Natural History Museum. My supervisor, Professor Guy Woodward at Imperial, and Steve Brooks at the museum. So um, uh, rivers are globally sort of um, threatened systems. Uh, they they have uh, water. They have sort of five key factors that are identified by David Dudgeon. Um, and uh, this has led to them being um, sort of disproportionately threatened compared to the terrestrial and marine. The sort of species they, yeah, they support are um, very threatened compared to uh, the marine and terrestrial sort of counterparts. Um, and uh, this has led to a wide range of sort of measures, sort of legislation operating at different scales to try and um, mitigate those impacts. Um, we have the Convention on Biological Diversity sort of IHE targets and also um, we have sort of in the sort of UK we have the Water Framework Directive which I'll talk about a little bit more um, and this has led to a sort of increased support from decision makers now I'm hoping this video will work no I don't think it will I know the human being you can't quite hear that that's George Bush just saying that um, he hopes that there, he can see a future where uh, fish and humankind can coexist peacefully and I very much uh, I very much doubt that Donald Trump shares that same sentiment but you know we'll see what happens um, anyway so 
Uh, the EU Water Framework Directive, uh, this is the sort of most important bit of legislation here in the UK and most of Europe, so it's, um, it's, a, it's a pretty um, a impressive piece of legislation and very ambitious. So it expected us to achieve good um, water quality for all uh, surface waters in Europe by 2015 and it's now be ex been extended to 2027. Uh, while there have been sort of uh, increases, measurable increases in uh, water quality due to increased um, sort of uh, sewage treatment and uh, reduction in sort of um, acid rain and things, uh, the expected ecological bounce back hasn't been what we sort of expected. So um, we've started to look at other measures to try and um, restore rivers. Uh, and this is often sort of focused on habitat restoration measures. Um, so the river restoration of the last 30 years has sort of risen exponentially. Um, I quite like this sort of summary by Miller in 2010. Um, you could get drawn into the semantics of what restoration is. Uh, I'm going to talk about sort of habitat restoration. So I'm talking about largely reach scale um, efforts to increase habitat heterogeneity, which, um, uh, which we can see sort of from a few stuff. Well, this is a uh, Palmer town 2014 in the US. Sort of biodiversity, in improving habitats is a major goal. And um, this is often aimed at sort of in-stream hydromorphic or channel hydromorphic. Uh, because sort of catchment based strategies in developed countries where there's lots of competition for, for land use um, are very hard to actually implement. Um, here are just some examples of river restoration. So there's, they, they offer, there's sort of very um, different scales. We have the Kissimmee River Pro Restoration Project here, the before and after. You can see a channelised river has been returned to sort of natural profile. And uh, on a much smaller and less exotic scale, uh, what I work on in Kent, which is uh, introducing large woody debris at the uh, 100 sort of at the reach scales of 100 meters um, uh, and the underpinning theory to this is um, the field of dreams hypothesis which is a uh, sort of uh, got its name from a rather sort of far-fetched film with Kevin Costner you don't see very much anymore um, and it's the idea that if you build habitats you will see a return in species um, this can be seen as an extension of the sort of habitat heterogeneity um, hypothesis which is a real cornerstone of ecology um, and it assumes that yeah where, where you've had uh, um, a sort of homogenized habitats if you re reintroduce that heterogeneity you'll see a return in species um, now in the, the literature is sort of caked with these idealized flow diagrams of um, adaptive management cycles where uh, um, you sort of uh, you you, you uh, try and see what's wrong with the river and then you reintroduce you, you um, do that you perform the restoration to mitigate that and uh, you monitor before and afterwards and from that you can assess whether um, whether it's worked however this monitoring which is always talked about is is very rarely implemented so we have uh, not a tragic sort of gap year tattoo but this kind of um, <laughs> Arabian kind of circle of a uh, of a sort of qualitative largely qualitative um, uh, reviews and anecdotes for reviews which um, um, which are a sort of feedback into more strategies that perhaps aren't working. So we don't see a kind of an adaptive management cycle where we're progressing towards ever more ecologically effective restorations. Um, a key part of assessment and monitoring and really disentangling the effects of restoration from wider environmental noise uh, is using this before-after control impact design, which is a kind of gold standard. So. Um, you have uh, you can you, you use controls to uh, isolate um, uh, temporal var variation, and uh, you monitor beforehand so you have a baseline to see what's changed. Um, I did a very sort of brief uh, analysis uh, a couple of weeks ago where I looked at 200 projects that were sort of case study projects on the uh, Wiki Reform database, and I found that uh, only um, well actually none of them had used this, this approach and 60% had no uh, sort of um, um, information at all. Uh, and uh, yeah, other ones use various combinations, but not the sort of full set that we're, that we're really after. Um, is the sort of hypothesis, the field of genes hypothesis even true? When we've seen uh, people like Jock and Kale and his group have done these, uh, have done a paper looking at um, uh, studies that they've collated that have all this data, they've actually found that um, even where you uh, um, where you monitor effectively that actually other environmental variables can have a greater effect than the restoration. So we have project age here having a really big effect 
river width, agriculture, organi organism group, and also the metrics used. So um, it really sort of emphasizes that perhaps we're putting too much on this, um, uh, this theory of um, the field of dreams. And further still, you can see specific examples. So here, uh, the response ratio on fish abundance um, reduces where, where you have a greater agricultural extent, percentage extent of land. Um, and here, project age has a negative effect on magnified abundance. So these are really interesting uh, and really crucial things to sort of better understand for us to make restoration more effective. Um, fortunately, rivers uh, are sort of culturally significant and they occupy, um, yeah, they, they, w within the landscape. And they have a diverse range of stakeholders, um, landowners, angling groups, um, and local environmental groups. And uh, these invest a lot of time and effort into river restoration um, and also are very keen to volunteer in things that will sort of have a beneficial impact on, um, on, on rivers. Uh, from the 2012 National Angling Survey, you can see that 25% of anglers, I think here actually this is the amount, 20% are already involved in some kind of volunteer work for, for their fishery. Um, and 26% so that they'd be interested in doing some environmental improvement work. Um, and water quality monitoring initiatives, as Ian has showed us earlier, uh, have really been an integral part of the citizen landscape for, 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 for a very long time. And they, um, are, citizens are already using quite complex uh, um, monitoring protocols, uh, including using sort of macroinvertebrate indices to, um, to assess water quality. Uh, the Anglers Riverfly Monitoring Initiative provides a very good example of that. So um, it was launched uh, as part of the Riverfly Partnership Scheme, which was launched in 2004, and has uh, about 100 <coughs> different groups involved in trying to learn more about rivers and, um, and protect them from um, degradation. Uh, as you can see from this map here, this is quite, quite interesting, you can see that it's got a really big spread. So I'll just get some nice stats on that that I can't quite remember off the top of my head. So now a, uh, it's a national network with over 2,000 volunteers, 1,500 monitoring sites, uh, and 35 regional hubs. So it's pretty big. And what they provide is feedback, which is really important. Um, the, uh, the volunteers can load up their data online, and it's um, readily available in, in this form here. So they can click on their, on their site, on the map, and they can see that over time how their results are compared. Uh, a really important aspect of this is that the environment agency are involved too. So this, they provide a threshold level which, if breached, um, initiates a very quick response and they launch an investigation. Okay. Um, sorry if I go purple, I'm just trying to get this all out as quick as possible. <laughs> I'm just trying to remember to breathe. Uh, the River Kennet provides a really good example of this. So um, you can see that uh, they, breached the, they breached the threshold level here. Um, I think this is the, thresh yeah, the EA threshold and it initiated a response. And because they had before data, they could do a before, after, control, impact um, investigation of the recovery. So in a sense, uh, citizen scientists are already using um, backy approaches to monitor water quality. Um, what bioindicators would we use if we were gonna get them to monitor restoration? As uh, ecological status, good ecological status is the kind of target that we're aiming for, we should definitely try and involve some bioindicators. Um, Fish, they're, they're often the focus of most restoration efforts and probably why most people get involved, anglers specifically, of course. Um, and they are very good, at, good indicators because they occupy a sort of higher ecological niche, um, eco uh, eco um, trophic level. And uh, yeah, so they would be good, but they're quite expensive to monitor. Not everyone's going to have the equipment to do it. Although I do think that they might be able to um, find a way to, that they might be linked to an angling organisation who could do it potentially. <coughs> and here's just a quick video of uh, showing this could be perhaps a demonstration of varying skill sets between uh, volunteers. I'm not sure. There's at least two people who've come volunteering with me before. <laughs> Here we have the pro, the eel whisperer, knows what he's doing. <laughs> um, so, but actually, macroinvertebrates might be better. They're ubiquitous. They've been part of the sort of monitoring uh, landscape for a very long time, and they are. Um, yeah, and they're cheap and easy to use. They don't require, they don't require too much um, equipment. Uh, so what would we look at? Abundance versus richness. Well, the Riverfly Partnership, um, the uh, Anglers Monitoring Initiative, actually use a um, kind of quite 
uh, coarse taxonomic level. Um, and that's, that, that works because they're looking at pollution and they can just <coughs> use, which is characterized by a de sharp decline in sensitive taxa. Whereas uh, rural restoration is likely to be slightly more subtle and over time. And also the sort of frequency of monitoring is likely to be very different too. So in order to get the most out of your uh, river fly um, monitoring initiative, you want to sample quite frequently so you can pick up a uh, pollution incident as soon as possible. With uh, restoration monitoring, it's likely to be less. You could do it on an annual basis even. So that's definitely worth sort of, um, that's a sort of bonus actually of, of um, uh, that would make it quite easier, even if you do go to a slightly um, uh, more uh, resolved ta taxonomic um, yeah, level. There you go. Um, so what might it look like? These could be our volunteer monitoring groups and they could upload their data. Um, we might have regional coordinators like the Riverfly um, Monitoring Initiative. Um, and uh, the objectives could sort of feed back. I, I don't expect this to sort of take off very like immediately um, because it's, I, I, I'm trying to sort of make it look very simple, but I know that there's a lot more. I don't want to preach the converted, but um, getting these off the ground requires a lot of effort. Um, so briefly, other considerations. Volunteer skills and training. The, a lot of uh, um, water quality monitoring initiatives actually kind of have regional coordinators and they kind of train up the volunteers through classes uh, which are paid for, which can be paid for by sort of raising funds or, or, or pay for the volunteers pay for it themselves and they're not very expensive. Um, data collection and management and quality control and feedback are, are all very important aspects which I'll be happy to talk about with you later so I'm definitely running out of time. And dissemination of, oh gosh, anyway, <laughs> dissemination <laughs> results is very important. Yeah, two minutes. <laughs> I've got two minutes, okay. Um, dissemination of results, super important. If we could have something, uh, the feedback we could have would, would be something similar to what the, um, the River Monitoring Initiative have already. Um, and the dissemination of results could be done through river restoration centres and other platforms. Uh, we have the River Restoration Centre here in the UK and uh, the river, there's a, there's a European platform as well, um, uh, European Centre for River Restoration too, um, and also more traditional things like Twitter. Funding, uh, citizen science attracts a wide range of funders. You can have, even have the Coca-Cola Foundation, they're very keen on sort of it, projects that interact with, um, with, uh, with volunteers. Um, so here's a quick summary, but I know I'm literally running out of time. And um, thank you for listening. And sorry, that was a bit of a rush. <laughs> so we have time for one question. OK. All right. Okay. Thank you very Good. much. Uh, thank you. So, uh, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> right. Shall we just wait yeah, 15 yeah. seconds for the people outside to come in? Yes. There are three chairs down here, so if you want to come down and sit down, there are lots of chairs down here. Yeah, there's a couple at the front. And there's three at the front if you want to sit really at the front. <laughs> <laughs> So you're going to have to give me 15 yeah, yeah. seconds extra. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid it's come out of questions. Yeah, yeah. OK, everybody should come in. Uh, I'm going to ask Susanna to start. Uh, Susanna Mason is going to talk about population variability of species. Okay. Away you go. OK, so I'm going to talk to you about how you can use citizen science data to get um, information on population variability of species. So this is a bit of a methodological talk, but don't worry, there are no mathematical formulas, unlike this morning. So when ecologists want to look at population variability, they generally turn to abundance data, which is, of course, a measurement of the number of individuals of a species at a particular time and place. And this data is enormously useful for ecologists and helps us to monitor species populations, check how stable the populations are, see how they respond to environmental changes such as habitat change, climate change, impact of disease and predation. And the thing about abundance data is it takes a lot of energy to record. It's a very high intensive um, data source and for butterflies 
every year, volunteers walk strict um, fixed route transects and they walk them every week between April and September. So there's a lot of energy involved in collecting it. But because of this, it's got a problem. It's not that common a data source. Lots of species, lots of taxonomic groups just don't have that data. So what do we do? Well, we went looking for an alternative data source. We had a look at citizen science data, namely uh, distribution records, which is the observation of species presence in a time and space. And volunteers, citizen scientists, just go out on an ad hoc basis wherever they choose and just record the presence of species they find. And because of the method is a lot easier, this data is extremely prevalent. We've got lots and lots of citizen science data at the Biological Records Centre for lots and lots of taxonomic groups, and traditionally that is used to map species presence, as you can see with the purple emperor butterfly here. The thing is, abundance and distribution are related. If you have more individuals of a species in a particular place, you're more likely to observe its presence. And because there's this relationship, what we wanted to know is can we use citizen science data to provide information on population dynamics? So the objectives of our study were very simple. We were just answering two questions. The first one is can interannual changes in distribution records act as a proxy for interannual changes in abundance? In other words, if you have a series of year-to-year -year data um, of the changes in abundance from year-to-year -year of a species, and you get the same year-to-year -year changes in the number of distribution records, are there the same patterns? Do they have a good relationship? That's our first question. The second question is, can variability in distribution records act as a proxy for population variability? And what we mean here by variability is the average size of interannual changes in abundance of a species. Are the average size of those changes reflected in the average size of the interannual changes in distribution records, in the number of distribution records? And because we want to compare these data sources, we needed a taxonomic group with both <coughs> data sources, so that was butterflies. So we have our study species. We had 33 but butterflies that we studied. We had our study area, which was the UK, and we had our study period, which was 1976 to 2012. Then we got our data for abundance. That data came from the Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, and it's a national collated index. It's available online. Anyone can get hold of it. Then for distribution records, we got data for the butterflies for the new millennium recording scheme, which is run by Butterfly Conservation. We had our data and we logged it, and then we converted it to interannual changes using a simple subtraction. Then we look back at our two questions. So what are we interested in in our two questions? For the first question, what we looked at, we called the interannual distribution abundance relationship. And that very simply is the correlated relationship between these two variables. We wanted to know how well they fit together. So the way we quantified this relationship was the goodness of fit, the R squared value. For the second question, we were interested in variability. And how we looked at variability is we took our series of interannual changes for abundance and for distribution records. We converted all the change values to positives and we averaged. So what we got was the average size of interannual change. We took an absolute value because we were interested in the magnitude of the interannual changes, not the direction. And if we averaged across positive and negative changes, they would have cancelled each other out. So those were our methods. So moving on to the results. So this is question one, and I've got up here two example species, one with a very good relationship and one with a very poor relationship. So on the left-hand side, we've got the holly blue butterfly. <coughs> if you look at the top left on the x axis is interannual changes in abundance. On the y axis is interannual changes in the number of distribution records. And you can see these two fit together very well. There's a relationship of 0.85. On the bottom left, we have the same data, but as a time series. So we've got year along the bottom, the value up the y axis. And the solid line is abundance, and the dotted line is distribution. And you can see the peaks and troughs are matching very well in these two data sources. Then on the, left, on the right hand side, we have the same graphs, but now for marbled white butterfly, which has a very poor relationship. It's not matching very well. So you can see that the relationships varied quite a bit between different butterflies. Um, and I'll say it again. So we quantified the interannual distribution abundance relationship by the R squared values of these relationships. We were looking at the goodness of fit, how well they fit together. So we performed this uh, correlation for all our 33 butterfly species, 
and we found that the results varied quite widely. On average, it was, point, it was about 0.36. And we wanted to unpack question one a bit more. We wanted to say, you know, what explains this variation? Why are some species having such good relationships between abundance and distribution, and some aren't? And the way we chose to do this was to look at metrics we called biogeographical attributes. And these, very simply, were metrics that we thought might go some way to explaining why these, this uh, relationship varied between different species. And they were also very simple metrics that you can calculate using distribution data. You do not need any ecological knowledge to get this data. So uh, that was part of our reasoning as well. So we picked three. The first one was total number of records of a species across the entire study period. So how much data does it have? How common is it? And also how well recorded is it is, is another factor in this variable. The next was fractal dimension. And that is a measurement of how fragmented a species range is. Are the uh, sites that is found at clustered together? Are they far spread apart? And it's a very simple score between 0 and 2. 0 meaning the, rain, the species range isn't fragmented at all. 2 being it's completely fragmented. And the last one was variability in distribution records, which I've mentioned briefly <coughs> earlier, is the mean absolute interannual change in distribution records. This is the magnitude uh, of interannual changes that the species usually experiences in our study period. So we looked at the first two, and we have the interannual distribution abundance relationship on the y-axis, so this is the r-squared values, um, and we have the biogeographical attributes on the, on the x-axis, and we found no significant relationship for these two. We found that these did not influence the strength of the interannual distribution abundance relationship. But then we tested the last one, and we found there was a strong positive relationship. We found that um, the larger the interannual changes that a species generally experiences in distribution records, the better its interannual distribution relationship was the higher its R squared value was between the two interannual measures. And you'll notice that there are two species that do exceptionally well and also make the relationship non-linear. And these were holly blue and painted lady. And we think, the re well, the reason these species are so variable is holly blue is renowned for being a species with uh, defined fluctuations in its population. And there are various um, theories by about why this is. It could be parasitoids, it could be to do with the climate. And then painted lady is a migrant species. So one year it will be here, one year it will not be here, and that will give it very defined interannual changes and very large interannual changes. But we tested all the variables together in a phylogenetically informed model, and we found that only this variable came out as significant. Only this variable was affecting the relationship. And when we removed these two species, it remained positive and significant. So even though these species are above and beyond uh, the other species, there is a relationship going on here. So the answer to question one, can interannual changes in distribution records um, act as a proxy for interannual changes in abundance? The answer appears to be yes but for cer these certain species that show these particular characteristics of being highly variable in their population. So we move on to question two, and here we look at variability distribution records and population variability, which are two mean absolute values. And we found an extremely highly positive relationship. Again, these two species are going above and beyond but when we remove them, the relationship remains strong and positive. And so the answer to this is a resounding yes. It should <coughs> seems to be that the variability that species shows in its distribution records matches the variability in population, which is our headline result. So the conclusions are that citizen science data can provide information on population variability. And this could be enormously useful for conservation planning um, from understanding how a species is doing and how its population is fluctuating over time, which is also an important metric in uh, assessing a species' risk of extinction. The interannual changes in distribution records has some potential for being a proxy, but it seems to be only for certain species that are highly variable. But for these species, you may be able to use these 
uh, distribution record metrics to see how it responds to environmental change. But the next steps for this research are to assess the applicability of this method to other taxonomic groups. So far, we have only tested uh, in this example. So there is much to be done. And I will finish by saying thank you to all my co-authors and supervisors. Thank you for everyone who collects the data. Thank you for NERC for giving me funding for my PhD. Um, this work is getting ready to be submitted to a journal and hopefully will be published sometime early next year. So please come and talk to me about it if you're interested. And thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Susanna. There's a couple of minutes left for questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working on the marsh artillery butterfly, but at present and historic populations. Do you find that there are gaps in the citizen science data where people just aren't interested in butterflies in that area or they aren't collecting it? How does that impact what you found here? What I did is I only selected species for, st species for study that had data for all the years of analysis. Not just but that though, but regions of the UK. Um, yeah, there, well, there's a massive, there's massive spatial bias in recording effort, definitely. But I just, because I was looking at a national level, I just collated it all together. But that is certainly a big issue that I've come across in other, other projects. Mm -hmm. yeah. How is your surname pronounced? <laughs> <laughs> I just pick you because. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so thank you. That's really interesting. So it, to summarise, the first relationship you found was that the greater the variance, then the greater the covariance that could be. Associated yeah. with. Presumably that depends on spatial scale. Did you have the option of looking at finer scales? Yeah, so uh, we, we were interested in if there was any effect of uh, population uh, synchrony, um, and we looked at a national and a regional uh, level. We did that comparison, and we found that the values you got, the R squared values you got at the national level and the R squared values you got at the regional level were co uh, correlated, strongly positively correlated, so that it didn't it didn't change that much, but we couldn't do it for as many species as the national level. Um, yeah. One more question? No? Okay, thank you very much, Susanna. Uh, our next speaker is Alejandro Ruete, um, and he's going to talk about daily occurrence and seasonal site use model. Yeah, uh, hello. An alternative title to this could be how to better squeeze abundant citizen science data. <laughs> and I have to explain that, yes, it's for abundant data. For, so right now, a, a case of study could be the butterflies or dragonflies or other popular species. It's not um, the case for every species. And by citizen science data, uh, I refer broadly to opportunistic data. So this could be uh, applied to museum collections or any other presence-only data, right? Uh, and, and the data that I'm using is extremely uh, voluntary, so there is no effort to engage people because beer watchers are basically everywhere. <laughs> they will <laughs> skip their lunch to go and see to, to go up and watch birds and there are probably some bird watchers here I can tell <laughs> uh, <laughs> and yes the data is collecting at really exciting <coughs> rates for us who likes data and this is data from Art Databanken and that's the Swedish uh, Species Information Center which has a database running for quite many <laughs> years. And we see that the, the resolution and extent, both res increasing resolution and increasing extent, is uh, really exciting in, in, in the kind of things that, that we can ask to this data. But traditional approaches, uh, like occupancy models, because they were originally thought to to uh, use the data as, as best as you could with few samples throughout a season, they traditionally use an annual uh, closure assumption that's assuming that a population will stay in a site uh, during, a popul uh, during a season, a whole season, and whatever you see during the season is would be sort of the same population that you're observing. Uh, 
but uh, uh, besides that, we see that the number of observations, here we see, sorry for the tiny, tiny uh, font, but um, you see that number of visits, it's quite continuous uh, across the one season, and this is showing many sites and many years, uh, slightly declining at the end of the season. The, number, the species list length, that is, for each visit, how many species an observer uh, watched and recorded, uh, is quite constant. Basically the same throughout time, a little bit of a sort of <coughs> an, an in increment uh, towards the, the present, but you see more or less the same. And <coughs> the greatest variation we see between sites. There are sites that are very popular, some sites that are not so popular, but still have some visits. And with this, we see also variation in, we, we take this uh, species list length, and it's not only us, but it, it has been proved to be a quite good proxy for the quality of those observations, right? Some people just go see a, a bird that is, sounds interesting, record that, and continue, and some people stay, and try to record everything that is at the site. But the main things that we were, that we had in, in, in mind was, if we describe better site use instead of just occupancy throughout a uh, uh, whole season, would that tell a different story? And how can we uh, s describe site use? We can, we can, I will explain later. later. And then following up, if we know which species are w where during the season, uh, which species do we want to account for when we sum up re uh, richness? Is it all of the species that we see, or is it those species that uh, may nest in those sites that we are interested in? Are, are we interested in describing uh, this a site as useful or uh, interesting for those species that nest there, or anything that's passed by? So we have 107 wetlands defined. This is an example around Uppsala, where, where the university is based. And we see that there is variation in size of the wetlands, as uh, expected. And, and it's all over across Sweden. But uh, of course, the, the number of wetlands in the north are a bit lower. But that is um, not so relevant in this study. Then we have 77 wetland associated species with different uh, traits. <coughs> and if you came to this talk for the title in the program, which is different, uh, it says something that uh, expanding the possibilities of, of uh, un asking new questions to opportunistic data. And then you have to focus on these plots. And I will explain why. For each species, we estimated the occupancy not throughout the season but per day. We reduce. We were able to reduce the the closure assumption to a day, and for each day the, we simulate we estimated a colonization extinction from day to day per site. So we have a a, a persistence and a colonization probability, which gives a probability an occupancy probability. Uh, throughout the season, and in, in raw terms, we have zeros and ones, series of zeros and ones for each season, each species, each year. The side use will be, for us, the proportion of days a species is expected to be at the site. And we see that different species tell di have different stories in, on each site. Parallel to that, the occupancy model is uh, also able to separate the probability of detection, and the main predictor of that would be the species list, list length. So the number of other species that were observed in that par particular visit. And we see that uh, we use a saturation model, uh, slightly different to, to some other approaches. And this is where the story starts to get interesting. And uh, a typical, these are summaries of main site use, the proportion of days uh, per uh, the species is expected to be per site, average across a region, and this is occupancy, averages of ones and zeros per region. 
Uh, and we see that when the, the animal <coughs> occupancy model estimates that a species is basically present all over all the time, the mean site use may tell some other, uh, a slightly different story. The trends are pretty much the same, but the undergoing story may be different. We see that some species that reach a, um, a saturation in, in the region are probably still increasing in the way they occupy and they use the sites. That could be either abundance or number of sites that they're occupying. Um, some other rare species are the model is not quite sure, an animal model is not quite sure to, s to tell if it's there or not, while we, we can tell that, that the, the species is just briefly passing by and, and the, the it's quite interesting for observers, so they detect it, but they detect it very uh, few days throughout the season. And some other species, um, for example, this one, uh, if you really want, you can tell that there is a decline. You have to really want to say that. But, um, but it's a totally different story than what, what we can see on a, uh, on a continuous uh, occupancy on the region. Um, so this is one story. We can tell different things. We can explore um, the phenology of the species. <coughs> For this model is um, the, the, these curves of colonization extinctions are adjusted to each site and each year, so we can, uh, in, f in the future, with depending on the funding and et cetera, we can <coughs> explore how this phenology has changed through, through, through the years and try to explain that and explore uh, different other uh, aspects of the biology of the species at the site only using opportunistic uh, data. When we go to the richness question, we can track each species at each site. Therefore, we can add up the richness of each species each day. And these box plots show, uh, summarize all the sites. And we see the difference, the clear difference between our estimates and the raw observational data. We have corrected for quite a lot of uh, uh, detections that were not uh, Protected. Yeah. Um, but when we want to summarize per in in broader uh, time units like month or season, we have to make decisions. Do we count everything that was detected every uh, at least one day throughout the season, or do we try to explain or try to uh, characterize each site by the mean number of species? that is expected to be uh, co-occurring per day. That would be, that would be a, a median value per site. And these tell a quite a different story. If we explore a little bit more, we can set different criteria criterias for, for when a species is counted as present <coughs> in a site. And we can say, OK, we can count everything that is present at least once everything that is at least 20 days continuously or any, any 20 days spread throughout the season. Um, and the same for 30, 45, whatever you, you choose the, the criteria that makes sense biologically for you. And we see that some of those criteria will resemble quite, quite a lot this median value of expected number of species. And while you cannot track which species are uh, com composing this average number because some technicalities that we can talk over the coffee. Um, I like espresso if you want to invite me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> with this other method, setting up, uh, understanding which, uh, setting up uh, criteria that match these numbers, you can uh, understand which particular species are compo uh, composing the, uh, this richness. So you can track every single species. So rethink what is the best resolution for you. Dare to ask more questions. Go and explore more your data if that's what, um, what 
what your problem is about. Don't stick to, to models that are, are going around. Uh, they, they may be good for the other questions, but not for your question. Rethink what is richness for you. Do I sum up everything that passed by here? Or is, is something else that what I want to show in my figures? And use even bad quality information. We have used here even those single observations because they have information. We have corrected for the bias, but they have information for certain species that have been detected. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alejandro, for finishing with plenty of time for questions. Uh, people standing at the back would like to come forward and find seats. Questions? Okay, well, maybe it's coffee. You'll get, maybe yes. get an offer. Uh, <laughs> or two. All right, thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Pocock. <coughs> West, West Hang on a moment. So that yeah, nobody mind. misses you. Wouldn't it? Look. I'll be looking forward to getting some fresh air <laughs> in a quarter of an hour. For some reason they've given us the smallest room in the entire building, haven't they? I don't know why they did, but luckily we all like each other. Okay, one, uh, we're just waiting for, for the exact time to begin so that um, Michael's fans don't miss him as they surge in through that Johnson, door. at the moment there's a session full sign on the door outside. Is there really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, ooh, right. Oh. Okay, well... Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost true, isn't it? Um. <coughs> <coughs> oh, right. Session full minus about three. There you go, you see. Perfect. <laughs> um. <laughs> the seats are uh, up here. Yeah. <laughs> We were just waiting for you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you joked about fans coming in. I'm, st I'm still waiting for my mum to walk through. The <laughs> Are you really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, now, now the <laughs> much-anticipated <laughs> talk by Michael Pocock. Um, how patent oh, participation goodness. vary across citizen science activities? <coughs> right. Thank you. Um, that's a lot to live up to, especially being slightly oxygen-starved and um, <laughs> thick with cold. Well, there we go. Um, so yeah, it's great to be able to finish off this uh, session where we've been uh, thinking quite a lot about the process of citizen science. Of course, one of the things about citizen science is that um, the sorts of data which people, volunteers, are involved in collecting um, are so valuable that actually citizen science will be cropping up in sessions right across this conference, which is superb. Um, so, uh, sort of following on from the title of Jonathan's paper, what was it, five, six years ago? Um, the citizen science continues to rise in prominence, I think. Um, and one of the interesting things is that it's increasingly being regarded as essential to address sort of current concerns of uh, issues to do with environmental threats. Um, and so there was a report produced for the EU a while back talking about the value of citizen science for environmental monitoring. And it seems to be uh, really picking up rate within, within the environmental... Uh, sorry, the... European Union. Uh, the use of bi biodiversity indicators has been used for a long time, and in the UK, two thirds, sorry, oh dear, I'm getting completely in the middle. Uh, twen uh, eight out of the 23 rely mostly or, in t um, mostly or partly upon citizen science data. And if you look at the UK government's strategies recently for um, monitoring pollinators and looking at tree health, they explicitly mention 
the potential of citizen science, or the need actually, of citizen science to contribute to some of these questions. Uh, so particularly for tree health, which is something um, that I've been thinking about a bit about on recently, <coughs> um, they say that citizen science is essential to provide some of that early detection. Of course, there is the challenge with citizen science of distinguishing um, an absence of records from recording absence, which actually is not very often done. So, so distinguishing between the lack of records and the lack of observers is really, really important. And so that's something that I discussed in this paper here by taking um, data from uh, the Netherlands where an invasive species was uh, established and looking at its... Um, rates of detection and then applying that to the pattern of uh, citizen science monitoring within the UK. So the work that I'm presenting, although it's actually going to be mostly on Lepidoptera, was actually funded under the Tree Health um, uh, Initiative. And so <coughs> um, citizen science, it's been rising in prominence and so therefore there's increasing thought about its use as a tool. I think first of all, um, it's worth considering, if if people are considering, or government agencies are considering using citizen science, should be considering actually, should you be going for that in the first place at all? It's one of those things that's so trendy, it seems the obvious thing to do, but it may not necessarily be, this, be the case. And um, in this report, which I and others wrote for uh, CEPA, which has then been applied or taken up across Europe, we were asking that sort of question and then saying, actually, you know what, there isn't such a thing as citizen science, there are a wide range of different citizen science approaches. <coughs> These different citizen science approaches have different um, benefits, they have different opportunities. So rather than viewing citizen science as some sort of multi-tool, which is one thing to do everything, instead I view it much more as a toolbox, a toolbox of different approaches which vary in, um, in their usefulness for the particular question you might be interested in. And just to emphasise that briefly, this is from an uh, analysis of the traits of over 500 projects which match citizen science, so citizen science, volunteer monitoring, those sorts of things in ecology and the environment. Um, and broadly, what we found doing um, effectively a principal components analysis of this um, was we found most variation was on this axis. So the variation in most projects varied from this systematic sort of scientific sampling through to mass participation. But then there is another axis of elaborate to more simple um, approaches, um, and then a, a whole cluster of projects which were entirely online. And so you can be begin then to look at the different sorts of citizen science, so the um, uh, more uh, ad hoc or unstructured monitoring, which Susie was talking about, the much more structured monitoring, which leads to the uh, biodiversity indicators, some of the stuff which is hypothesis-led, so Jonathan's project Evolution Megalab, or Jonathan and others' project on that, um, and also down to the, the apps, so this sort of standard modern way uh, that the, you think of using citizen science by putting out an app and asking anyone to get involved. But I think the big question is, <coughs> so you've got this diversity of approaches, and I've said that it's, it's important for citizen science to be used appropriately, but how how do you know? How do you know what appropriate is? Well, I think we can make some guesses, but there's not actually much evidence for this. So I was interested in how these different sorts of approaches affect recruitment of participants, uh, retention, the evenness of contributions, and also their spatial distribution. And so I was looking at these five projects. <coughs> so I'll run through them briefly. Um, but you and I'll, I'll, I'll explain in just a moment how they represent um, that continuum from the more scientific sampling up here to the much more mass participation here. So the butterfly monitoring scheme, we've heard about it in a couple of talks, and I'm sure it's cropping up in other sessions across the conference, um, has been running for, uh, how long is it now, 30 years I think it is, 30 years that people have been uh, investing time walking these transects, um, recording uh, butterflies. It's a national moth recording scheme where people have been collating data for, well, it's been going on for over 100 years, I think. Um, records where people, enthusiasts, are going out collecting moths or recording moths, typically at moth traps, but not in entirely. The iRecord Butterflies app, 
um, was an app which was developed by Butterfly Conservation and CEH uh, a couple of years ago. And so that enabled anyone to get involved with um, recording butterflies and it provides a really handy um, field guide as well. Big butterfly count. Um, it's hard to compete when you've got someone that illustrious promoting your project, isn't it? Um, with that David Attenborough, in case you can't see there. And so that again was another project very much run as a mass participation project run by Butterfly Conservation um, with support from companies. And then Conquer Tree Science is a, a project that uh, myself and Darren Evans from the University of Newcastle have been running um, for about six years now, which is very much engaging school children but others as well uh, in, in getting involved in citizen science, both hypothesis-led citizen science, rearing parasitoids from these horse chestnut leaves, but also reporting the level of damage. <coughs> so can you, can you, uh, you can begin to summarise these projects by looking at this continuum, um, going from uh, experts getting involved here, where they go to set locations year after year after year, um, taking at least a couple of hours every single week to do this sort of thing, um, going on for a long time. And it's led to, this, to the use of these data in biodiversity indicators. Moths counts, just because moths are quite hard to identify and it requires a fair bit of investment if you're going to buy a light trap um, and then you'll need power to run it from as well. Uh, yeah, quite, quite tricky little brown jobs to identify many of them. So it tends to be more enthusiasts <coughs> who get involved with it, but they can do it anywhere, or at least anywhere where there's power if they're using a light trap. But it takes a, a fair bit of time, a fair investment to go through that. Um, but from these sorts of data we've been able to, I say we, uh, Richard Fox from Butterfly Conservation and others have been able to um, look at trends. So the iRecord um, butterflies I think tends to be used more by enthusiasts, but it's opening up to a wider um, audience in terms of participation. Um, and one of the things that this app particularly encourages people to do is to make site lists. Um, so we were hearing just a moment ago about the value of not just recording these ad hoc, hoc records, um, but whole sites, uh, sorry, whole lists of things at sites. <coughs> um, and then the final two projects are much more mass participation, so anyone can get involved anywhere. Uh, Big Butterfly Count, they ask you to count for 15 minutes. Concrete Science, you can just take a handful of seconds to make a report and do that. And so this goes on this broad scale from scientific sampling through to mass participation. And so I was then <coughs> um, interested in different measures of participation, temporal measures, so looking at recruitment, the intensity, the number of records per person per year, the annual rates of retention, the e evenness of contributions, which I'll explain in a moment, and then looking at the spatial measures as well. So you can see that, um, remarkably actually, looking at uh, these projects over the course of the past, it's, um, about five, five to ten years, um, varying across the different projects. They tend to tend to engage one to two thousand people per project. Um, of course, these projects are different in terms of the fact that this has been running for a long time, and there's a long network. Yep. Um, there's a wide network of uh, uh, experts who are supporting those um, volunteers going out to doing the recording. Uh, these sorts of projects rely much more on the mass media to promote them and to try and get. Um, people enthused. <coughs> you can also see that there's variation in terms of the number of records per person. Now some of this is, I think this is much more project specific and so you can begin to try and explain the variation here in terms of the uh, particular aspects of each particular project which maybe is not so useful in terms of understanding overall trends. But it becomes more interesting when you start looking at annual rates of retention so these projects which are much more focused on the scientific sampling, much more specialist projects if you like, uh, tend to have much higher rates of retention than these ones down here which are much more about mass participation. So it's the sort of thing you would expect but this is actually quantifying some of these trends. And um, <coughs> if you look at, um, <coughs> I think, oh yeah. Um, if you look at this 80-10 rule, uh, sorry, 80-20 rule, so quite often you would expect when you look at things like um, the inequality of global wealth, Wikipedia edits, participation in all sorts of different things, there's this thing where it tends to be that 20% um, of people contribute or have 80% of the stuff, the things. 
Um, and that seems to be very much the case here with many of these projects. Now this is slightly lower, I think, by design because they're saying we want everyone to go out on these transects to record, um, to record in a very set way. But these, these couple of projects are very close to that 80%. These are much lower, and I think that's because they tend to have much lower recording intensity, so the average person will only submit two records per, per year. <coughs> and the other thing moving on to the spatial is that you can see that recording intensity is spatially patchy. Um, and it's the sort of thing which, as ecologists, will look at that and go biased. So statistically, that would be a biased spatial distribution. Um, but just cutting out a section of Middle England um, for these five projects, you can see that actually all of these are, and statistically you can test this and show that they all are spatially patchy. So you will get different things. There's quite often um, a gradient north to south, but there are different clusters of, um, of records as well. <coughs> now, um, those of you who are more astute will probably also have already uh, picked up on the fact that this does seem to be really quite closely related to that distribution of um, people and we, we heard that earlier on a, on a couple of uh, report a couple of talks with people talking about this and so I went through and I uh, statistically modeled that so looking at the concretary science levels of participation if you look at the red line you can see that it's positively related so basically the more people there are living in a one kilometer square the more records you will get with this project on average um, which makes a lot of sense for a mass participation project once again you can compare this across the different projects um, this is remarkably flat and again I think that's partly by design so it shows that if you do want to do something in a very designed way um, then you can get this uh, much weaker relationship with human population density and I think it becomes very interesting when you look at these sorts of projects where you tend to get highest rates of participation actually in the suburbs rather in this than in the city centres I'm sure that's something to do with the fact um, that it's either yep, <coughs> it's either that naturalists are not going to the city centres, or they're not, or they're going there and not seeing much, um, or in the case of this, they're probably choosing not to live in the city centres because um, they like the wildlife and don't see so much of it there. It's also interesting to see that um, there's a slight dip up towards the end. So certainly the moth recorders are going to the least inhabited places. Um, to make records, which again makes sense because that's where the nature reserves are likely to be. And I think one of the sort of unifying ways of understanding this is um, something which was introduced to me by the Common Cause for Nature report, which is about this intrinsic versus extrinsic motivations. So this is much more about people who are already enthusiastic, um, they're already, uh, they've got that connection with nature, they appreciate it because of that sense of beauty and discovery and also community that they get. Whereas a lot of this is framed more, not always the case, but more in the sense of we need your help, nature needs your help, nature's under threat, please do something. Um, <coughs> and so, that's the summary. But I think the thing about this is understanding that um, if you're going for mass participation, it's not allowing the uh, bias, the potential bias and the spatial bias to work in your favour. So to to look at that for particular questions, which might be early detection of invasives within cities and things like that. Longer term monitoring needs different sorts of approaches in order to be more effective. And trying to understand human motivations is important as well. So final plug for the BS Citizen Science Group. If you're not um, on the mailing list, you're very welcome to join up. You won't get bombarded with emails, um, and but you will get early notice about the range of different events we've got coming Thank up. Thank you very year. much, Michael. <laughs> so, um, uh, we, we've come to lunch. I just wanted to make an announcement, which is that that actually was a typo, and it should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah>. Sorry. <coughs> No, I bet you they're really good. I, I use them both. You, you, you did want to turn right as well. Yeah. Yeah. You basically see the H roll. I always think it's quite interesting.
where you can sort of where the government say the boundaries so the government does the buck on citizen society or society citizen society one of the other we were talking to the EA the other day at the partnership and they were suggesting maybe the EA should follow up on, on sort of when, the, when the breach is sort of triggered, they should be there, yeah, they should have to do yeah. the investigations themselves. Which kind of yeah. I'm not sure if you do, I'll meet you out outside here. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll go around back. Hello. Hello. I've not see seen you for ages. Well, no. well, we saw you on Skype, but. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I keep meaning to join the group. Um, yeah.